All right, um, we're going to go ahead and start the third session. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Luis Lawrence, uh, who is the Associate Professor in New Testament Studies at the University of Exeter, where she serves as the Director of Education for Theology and Religion and the Liberal Arts Programs uh, there. Um, she's published uh, extensively on anthropology and biblical studies, and I believe it's your fifth monograph that is due out on the Bible in Bedlam. Um, it's going to be due out this August with TNT Clark. So please welcome Professor Lawrence. Don't touch my paper. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you, Chris and James, for the invitation um, to this afternoon. It's been a great day so far. I kind of feel like I've got the the hardest job when they said you've got to talk about the futures of the discipline. It, it, it's really difficult. Plotting potential futures of social scientific criticism of the New Testament, not least due to mounting suspicion that there will be or even should be such a phenomena, was in hindsight a foolhardy task to undertake. The mandate for narratives of future progress and development within disciplines or intellectual traditions are often motivated by radical extremes, overconfident optimism or apprehensive dread. For the former, visions of the future often include a celebratory coming of age and our review of our achievements narrative designed to support the unquestioned expectation of both a tradition's legacy and longevity. For the latter, strategies for the future are often accompanied by disciplinary angst, vulnerability, feverish self-doubt. Such self-preservation narratives often purposefully align themselves within those spaces which are perceived as the most substantial, robust and durable disciplinary heartlands. Trying to circumvent these two extremes while still writing within a futures of dot 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 genre, my aims here are twofold. First, rather than attempting to prophetically map out imaginary futures, which at best are unverifiable and at worst unlikely, I'm going to embark on the far more modest task of thinking about how academic descendants may view the scholarship of the present. To use social scientific inflected terminology, how will the social identity of early 21st century social scientific criticism of the New Testament, including its tribes and territories, likely be constructed, celebrated, chastised or disregarded by generations to come? Will they think it is just a little odd? that in 27, 2018, we met to reflect on a tool of study rather than an actual substantive, substantive topic. Will they view this, this symposium as symptomatic of what Moore and Sherwood mockingly berate as the biblical scholarly susceptibility to methodolatry and methadone addiction? Second, I will attempt to briefly chart a number of emerging turns, effective, spatial, cognitive and digital, within the humanities and social sciences, which are variously challenging established theoretical and methodological canons to refigure academic practices and interests. How will these turns, if at all, likely influence and refigure interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary encounters between the social sciences and New Testament studies in the academies of the future. So first of all, the social identity of social scientific criticism, tribes and territories. Academic disciplines and cultures have been re rendered through a sociology of knowledge lens as tribes with recognisable identities, cultural attributes, ideologies, myths, and territorial markers. These tribes occupy particular fields of research, demarcated not only by their specialised knowledge, but also, in Ken Highland's terms, their aims, social behaviours, power relations, political interests, ways of talking, and structures of argument. Crucially, it is through these that tribes consecrate their cultural privilege. John Eliot's off-cited definition of social scientific criticism remains a useful go-place to begin our observations. 
Social scientific criticism, he says, of the Bible is that phase of the exegetical task which analyzes the social and cultural dimensions of the text and of its environmental context through the utilization of the perspectives, theory, models, and research of the social sciences. As a component of, a histor of the historical critical method of exegesis, social scientific criticism investigates meaningful configurations of language intended to communicate between composers and audience. Two features are of particular note here. First, it's naming and territorial location, and secondly, practices and methodology. So to the first, naming is key in constructing and inscribing an identity. What then is communicated through the moniker social scientific criticism? Despite this descriptor's widespread use and currency within New Testament studies, it is still largely unknown outside this particular tribe. Database searches limit its use of applications of social theories to biblical material, or even more narrowly to New Testament texts. Indeed, whilst the SBL program unit, Social Scientific Criticism of the New Testament, directly employs this compound noun phrase, the equivalent Hebrew Bible unit, in contrast, calls itself social sciences and the interpretation of Hebrew scriptures. Forging diverse social sciences, although probably in reality it's predominantly sociology and anthropology, into a singular homogenizing criticism label, which is then used to denote a scientist application to biblical texts, belies a European and more broadly Western intellectual identity which had its genesis in an Enlightenment scientific paradigm and posited the scholar as a rational subject positioned out of time and space. In Moore and Sherwood's views, isms, the notion of advanced critical machinery for highly trained operators, appealed to our Enlightenment biblical scholarly sensibilities. Margaret Price reveals how after the political movements of the 1960s, academic discourse began to replace the language of reason and rationality with criticism, criticality, and critical thinking. In both instances, the ideal of the humanist subject, inscribed as rational, white, heterosexual, may, male, European, Eurocentric, remained normative. Feminists, among others, have warned against the fallacy of believing that social scientific criticism in any way yields an objective reality for all models and frameworks are prescriptive and political and thus create reality just as much as they describe it. The construction of a specifically Mediterranean cultural script has, for example, been the subject of condemnations of this sort. James Crossley has warned such scripts seem to negatively stereotype other individuals, communities and countries across a wide geographical expanse and harbour not only imperialistic overtones, but at worst, sometimes latent racism. In a somewhat different vein, Todd Penner and Davina Lopez have contended that the proliferation of the language of criticism to name a particular tribal exegetical approach is consistent with a Western neoliberal economic paradigm which encourages branding and individual competition. In their words, branding is a critical means of performing a type of neoliberal subjectivity in New Testament scholarship, wherein scholars construct and promote themselves as brands, sellers, consumers in relation to intellectual currents and content. Marketing social scientific criticism then for the future could be seen by its main advocates as an essential tactic. For whilst research centres such as this one at St Mary's remain energetic and funded, and particular sub-branches such as the North American Context Group still meet regularly, elsewhere within the academy, the social scientific critical tribe seems increasingly under threat, or at least progressively harder to directly observe. Last year, BNTC, British New Testament Conference, for those of you not from this side of the pond, closed its Social World of the New Testament seminar, which in the past had profiled social scientific readings of early Christian communities and, and texts. This was mainly due to a lack of participation and competition from the newer New Testament and early Christianity seminar. Engram statistics, albeit be very suspicious of these, bold and blunt tool, 
also indicate a general decline in the actual use of the moniker social science scientific criticism to 2008, where these data banks go to, a trend which seems only to have continued in the last decade. However, social scientific criticism's territorial claim as a component of the historical method of exegesis may go some way ironically to explaining both its diminishment as a discrete tribe, but also ensuring it a secure place for the future within the historical critical core of the discipline. Unlike more marginal interpretive tribes, disability, queer, feminist, global, black, which always have to incur a tribal name to signal their otherness from the mainstream, social scientific criticism has been increasingly grafted into an unacknowledged and often unnamed historical <coughs> critical centre. David Horrell reveals as much, and I don't often disagree with him, <laughs> but here I am. <laughs> he says, it will, I think, remain the case that a more socially grounded approach characterises New Testament studies broad, more broadly in a way that was not so 25 years ago. That, in part, represents an achievement of those who have energetically promoted this aspect of New Testament study. But given this fact and the diverse directions in which future work will go, it will, I think, be harder and harder to draw any legitimate or meaningful boundary around social scientific interpretation, defining what does and does not count as such. Nor should this fuzzy, indefinable work be a cause of concern or regret. Unlike sociologists, anthropologists, geographers, historians, we have defined body of text and a circumscribed historical period that determines the central focus of our discipline. It is interesting that those projects which most frequently utilise social science theory or methodologies to chart reception histories of biblical texts in eras beyond, in Horrell's words, the decisive historical period that determines the central focus of our discipline, are rarely, if ever, located within social scientific criticism's territory as presently defined. Though the contributions to today's event under the umbrella of social scientific criticism and early Christian origins, especially James's pr presentation later on the Bible and contemporary politics, perhaps start to push back against this gatekeeping of the name. This leads neatly into consideration of the tribe-like practices and methodologies of social scientific criticism as presently defined. Here purposefully constructed and caricatured as the armchair identity of the social scientific critic and the sterile interdisciplinary encounters that they typically enact. 19th century armchair anthropology has been ridiculed in times uh, since as a passive pursuit, done from the comfort of one's desk rather than the complexity of the field, with minimal analytic reflection synthesising the materials of other writers. In many ways, and I'm being provocative here, I'm, 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 I know I'm being caricaturing and, and what have you. In many ways, social scientific criticism of the New Testament could similarly be identified as an armchair approach. For most practitioners adopt idealised models, methods, lenses, hermeneutical frameworks from the foreign field, abstracted from the written works of social scientists. Few have undertaken training or field work in social sciences themselves. Moreover, and most surprisingly, very few projects, despite a repeated refrain regarding the interdisciplinary identity of the criticism, have involved direct collaboration between social science and biblical scholars. I noticed that the, um, the volume that came out of the City um, conference that was here a couple of years ago had Paul Cloak, who's a geographer, but it's very few and far between that you actually find those names. This may once again be accounted for by policing of tribal territories, but surely future interdisciplinary ventures need to be genuinely populated by diverse figures. Bill Reddings, in his sardonically titled book, The University in Ruins, and I don't know whether it, it charms as much in the US as it does over here, but it sometimes feels like we are working amongst ruins, <laughs> argued forcefully against the marketization of the academy and was innately suspicious of those self-proclaimed interdisciplinary spaces that in reality were insular and independent. He saw such spaces as sinking back into becoming quasi-departments with budgets to protect and little empires to build. 
More authentic interdisciplinary encounters, in his view, tended to be short-term, ad hoc, and often on a theme and stimulated by a genuine openness in intellectual inquiry. Elizabeth Bird has similarly noted the power of the established disciplines to incorporate new knowledge without ceding territory to those who are intent on a wholesale reform of the system, and sees this as an illustration of how academic knowledge and academic institutions can maintain essential conservatism, preserving a status quo by limited concessions to innovation. This chimes in some ways with broader suspicions about the reductionism of social scientific criticism when applied to religious phenomena. For example, Horrell and Crossley have noted the influence of Marx and Marxist studies doing history from, from below and on class conflict, popular culture and popular protests have been areas that um, largely disregarded um, in biblical studies, perhaps due to the innate suspicion of Marxism in mostly Christian New Testament scholars' worldviews. Another significant debate centred on the status of methods and methodologies and models in social scientific criticism, particularly in light of the scant nature of much of the biblical evidence. Are these inevitably determinative, shaping and directing one's investigation and conclusion? The concentration on collective group consciousness, which characterises so much social scientific inquiry, may also elide the part that individual agents have in initiating transformations, for one routinely assumes texts of productions or reflections of communities. Such insights need to be part of any critical social endeavour, for all cultures involve agency, and all cultures involve agents acting in structured ways. Moreover, the ability of the individual to exercise agency depends on their social position. John Law has bemoaned an analogous, modernist social scientific aversion to what he calls the messiness of social life, and the ways and means by which individuals and performances frequently break the straitjacket of neat, sterile, hygienic social scientific treaties. Entertaining the possibilities of mess um, within the worlds which created the New Testament and the messy worlds the New Testament continues to create seems another significant, albeit complex and challenging direction for the future. So let's turn to turns. In reimagining the tribe, territories, and methodologies of social scientific criticism of the New Testament, so called turns within broader humanities and social scientific um, disciplines, which contest accepted concepts, highlight omissions in traditional methods, offer really provocative phenomena to think with. Vincent Leitch refers to such turns as postmodern interdisciplines which is self-consciously constructed against the blind spots or prejudices of more traditional heartlands. Here, selected turns will be illustrated mainly by reference to recent doctoral work on the, in, on the Bible in these areas. They are the future. Notably, none of this new generation of scholars cited explicitly identify themselves in their writings as practitioners of social scientific criticism per se, their methodological and thematic diversity perhaps resists such labels. That said, they all could be said to, at least in part, occupy territories which social science criticism has or could claim as its own through their broad inspiration from social science in their reading of biblical texts and or, in some instances, their own ethnographic fieldwork research. Discussion here has hinted of the privileging of rationality, criticality, and latent Eurocentricism in the field of historical critical biblical studies and its allied social scientific critic tribe. Such worldviews have often dismissed emotional or affective dimensions as irrational. Moreover, it has been keen to other others as over-emotional. It is perhaps no surprise, or maybe it is, Oh, it's, rather, it's rather dismal, um, that in a recent sociological study by Andrew Village, which attempted to social scientifically profile the typical SBL member, the core historical work of the discipline, he says, was featured as thinking, and the more marginal approaches were identified as intuitive and emotional. He writes, intuitives, 
as opposed to thinkers, were particularly likely to work with cultural studies, autobiographical, post-colonial, post-modern criticism. There was also a link between uh, preference for feeling type judging and the broad areas of reader-centered and ideological criticism. This may be because these areas are developing more value-based ethics of interpretation, which require application of feeling rather than thinking. Whether these results are representative or entirely accurate, they do nonetheless show something of tendencies within the ethos of the discipline, fostered through its practices and contexts, which are, as just the Fiorenza contends, almost indelib also indelibly reflective of webs of power. She notes how it becomes important to explore concepts not just in terms of the ethos of the individual biblical scholar, but also in terms of the professional ethos of the discipline that determines the social self-identity, positioning and socialization of the emerging biblical scholar. Among projects which have attributed to an effective term, which perhaps starts to reclaim some of the emotional within uh, this discipline, and it was stimulated in part, I think, by queer and feminist theory, it signals a renewed attention to the material, embodied, and sensory. Feelings conceived as both sensory, physical phenomena and sentiments, emotions, thus render Cartesian fed dualism, such as mind, body, internal, external, psychic, social, physical, moral, biological, political, as erroneous. Feelings in this respect, emotions in this respect, play important roles in social movements, for they have power to arouse affiliation and identification, exclusion and segregation. Effects, in this sense, pose questions about the links between the subjective and the cultural, the individual and social, self and other. Catherine Hockey, in her Durham PhD thesis, Seeing Emotionally, an investigation of the role of emotion in the discourse of one Peter, is able to respond in some ways to this effective turn and show the emotive as central to the epistle and how cumulatively, in her words, the emotions are used by the author to build an alternative view of reality. For the believer, this leads to a new understanding of the structuring of their world, encourages a reassessment of personal goals, and ultimately aims to affect <coughs> identity and behaviour. Social scientific criticism if you kind of did a data plot of what the sort of interests are over the last 30 years, have predominantly been preoccupied with human communities, great individuals, and the development of these over time, institutionalization, development of leadership patterns, development of ideologies. Space, in contrast, seems to have often been framed more typically in a Eurocentric vein as a static husk or background against which great events and movements play out. And actually, the paper this morning on um, Crete was very interesting in relation to how you were sort of plotting identity, and I think that very much fits into this spatial sort of interest. The spatial turn in both the humanities and social sciences constitutes a response to this long-standing ontological and epistemological bias that privileges time over space in all human sciences. Wei Hassan Wan, who was a contributor to your city uh, uh, um, uh, uh, conference a couple of years ago, in his recent PhD, and all of these PhDs I've picked are ones that aren't yet in the public domain or haven't been published. They are just in their, in their lovely... Uh, yeah. What do you call it? I don't know. Uh, Fetus-like state. Um, uh, reconfiguring the universe, the contest for time and space in the Roman imperial cults and one Peter. In this thesis, he attempted to challenge the notion of space as static or given and set out to redress an imbalance between time and space in his interpretive framework. Where he considered how imperial cults of Anatolia and one Peter offered diverse, divergent constructions of time, space and reality. And these cleavages along temporal spatial lines index divert divergent competing and conflictual worldviews. Way submits that one Peter challenged Rome's claim to dominance on a cosmic scale with its substitute construal of space and time. 
In a very different kind of project, Helen John, in her 2016 PhD thesis, The Bodies, Spirits and the Living Landscape, interpreting the Bible in Avambalan, Nobibia, also seeks to deconstruct the Western idea of space as background through charting how her informants conceptualise the land and space as active and alive. She conducted ethnographic fieldwork in Africa for over a year, in direct contrast to the methodologies of what I've kind of caricatured as armchair social scientific critics, in order to concretely engage with non-European viewpoints in their interpretations of gospel texts. Thirdly, the cognitive turn, and it's really great that the paper next to the off is going to do some of this as well. Um, the cognitive turn confers precedence to study of the mind and broader evolutionary patterns of the species over study of isolated communities and individuals. Often language is used to view the mind's architecture as represent representational. This turn has far-reaching implications for both social scientific inquiry into human culture and meaning and a textual discipline such as biblical studies. Mark Turner has proposed a model of how humanistic and cognitive scientific study could emerge with social science to create a new field which he's termed cognitive social science. Daniel McLennan, um, a current PhD student, is trying to respond to such a turn. His primary focus is on the relationship of Yahweh to cultic objects and representatives in the Hebrew Bible, with special attention given to the Ark of the Covenant and the Messenger of Yahweh. And he applies insights from cognitive sciences, specifically cognitive linguistics, claiming that social or environmental input alone is not adequate to, to account for mental output. Finally, um, the digital. If academic turns are, represent those junctures which mark fundamental change of focus or method, then digital technology's current reshaping of the research <coughs> landscape will, I suspect, prove to be one of the most significant. A motion towards this can be sensed in the scheduled 2018 SBL unit on social scientific criticism and the New Testament, which, it says on the website, will review the Bible Odyssey website through the lens of social science. I don't know exactly what approach this session will take, but given that Bible Odyssey is primarily a kind of public-facing teaching platform for sharing and displaying research, rather than facilitating digital research in academy, my hunch would be that social scientific methods employed may involve statistical data and patterns concerning users of the site. But digital technology's utility and influence goes far beyond publishing or a platform for um, sort of disseminating research not least reinvigorating a turn to the visual. Due to the social scientific critic using methodologies abstracted from text, obviously, rather than observation of the lived or material world, iconological studies which view the meaning and impact of New Testament textual images in the light of their visual representation in the wider cultural world has often played second fiddle to more text-centric approaches. The digital display of material artifacts through 3D scanners could also invigorate visual dimensions of the exegetical task enormously. In Exeter's Digital Humanities Lab, for example, the virtual Magic Bowl archive here allows researchers not only to view, but also to interact, spin, turn, flip balls, and view them at high levels of resolution. Digital projects such as this can also turn ten attention away from elite statuary to the importance of more mundane material objects which are intimately connected to human identity and action. It is not only in incorporating or displaying visual data, however, that a digital turn could reimagine practices of the social scientific critic of the New Testament. Complex geospatial patterns in narratives, identified through coding, for instance, have been plotted to unveil interesting and hitherto unknown connections in other disciplinary terrains. Another digital humanities project in Exeter, Famine and Dearth in India, 1550 to 1800, connected cultural histories of food security, for instance, has charted the story of Peter Mundy, the son of a Cornish pilchard merchant, through famine choreography. A digital mapping of Mund Mundy's travel narrative in India 
displays not just the root of the journey, but also Mundy's growing understanding of place, space and people, and his changing emotional responses in the course of his travel. So they have the, his various um, uh, narratives from his diaries, and then they've colour-coded sort of themes, and they've colour-coded emotional responses that they're looking at as they, as they track this literature. Could similar digital research strategies track the travel journeys and evolving attitudes of early Christians, or chart evolving attitudes and worldviews through the circulation and reception of biblical texts in different eras and contexts? Such techniques could offer the social scientific critic not only newly d digitally generated data, but also important perspectives from which to craft alternative insights into the individuals and groups they seek to understand. Our, this, so to sum up, our disciplinary territory involves a particular corpus of ancient texts and their continuing afterlife in subsequent and myriad contexts. How we tread upon, navigate and journey through this territory inevitably involves different lenses, maps and navigational tools. If the metaphor of social scientific criticism as a disciplinary tribe has been forced in this paper, and I'm well aware it is not one without its shortcomings, colonial connotations, sticky histories of the term, minimisation of diversity within the discipline, the metaphor of territories incurs and retains more purchase. For there are undeniably certain ways of being and doing within our own academic patch. That said, it seems to me that if social scientific criticism of the New Testament, whatever social identity that may take in years to come, is to have a future, it needs to escape some of the silos it often unconsciously retreats within to work in genuinely interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary spaces. First, it will need to conduct an honest, metacritical interrogation of its own identity and culture, even if that leads ultimately to forced abandonment of some of its most venerated rituals, customs and habits. Thank you. I'm sorry if I was a little bit long. We still have five minutes for questions. Okay, I'm sorry, it's a little bit long. Yes, sir. Questions? Yeah. Ooh. If I understand your point here correctly, if the armchair social scientists wait long enough, then you can <laughs> Through digital <laughs> technologies. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, of course, there are questions of resource, there are questions of all sorts of stuff that, that impinge on this. But it, it I mean, I, I supervised Helen John's thesis on um, ethnogra ethnography of Namibia and, and then looking at how people respond to biblical texts. And it seemed to me that her project was, was, um, was one that the method should have happened a lot more. I mean, in some respects, you've had kind of Bailey's work on parables and sort of reading in the Middle East, but, but he, he was kind of occupying a space and reading material with communities. She was actually doing ethnographic fieldwork on homestead in this very remote village. And, and in a sense, it, it, you know, I'm an armchair anthropologist. I don't even like going north of Newton Abbott. You know, Bristol is the other end of the world to me. It's amazing that you've got me here because I really, you know, I'm... Um, uh, so it, it's, it's um, it, yeah, there's all sort of, even in anthropology itself, you know, now you have to do the, an ethnography of the bus stop outside because there's no resources to kind of do the, the stuff that you need. Um, so you do auto ethnography. Um, but, but, but it seems to me that, that, that China to actually occupy, you know, that, that we have these kind of silos that we feel that that's their patch, that's our patch, we can't kind of give ground. That, that in a sense, you know, and digital technologies is, is an interesting one that kind of um, spans disciplines. I mean, in this, in our institution, it, it's a humanities digital research um, space. So it, it, it's interesting how it's making um, different silo disciplines actually work on projects together and share methodologies. And I think, well, actually, that's a really good thing that perhaps we should, should do more often. But yeah, perhaps it does kind of, um, it will mean that armchair anthropology or, yeah, apple anthropology will be the, the way forward. <laughs> Any further questions? It's one over there. <laughs> Yeah. Um, can you just, you kind of drop that in as a nice aside, can you just contextualize that a little bit? Um, 
summarise it for us? Tell us what the study was, what methodology, background does this person have to split those two up? She wasn't spitting them up at all. She was trying to bring them together. In a sense, the effective turn... Um, it's maybe an un unfair thing. I, I said to you at lunch, didn't I? I said, one of the, I really loved your paper, Sarah. I thought it was really great. Um, but, but, but my instinctive reaction was, oh, you know, people don't just think discursively. They feel and do stuff. And, I mean, one of the things that I've really worked on is disability studies. My last two projects have been on that. So I'm very keen to kind of show embodiment and the lived body as not something that can be kind of seen as secondary. You know, that in a sense is a powerhouse of thinking and feeling and being just as much as kind of ideas and tropes. And, um, and so in a sense, her project situates... I mean, it was a project that, that she... Um, said she was inspired by Stephen Barton's emerging work in Durham on kind of effective economies. He does stuff, effective economies of temple and space. And she did an MA module with him, and that kind of became the, the, um, the, the starting point of her, uh, her work on, on um, feeling and effect. So, yeah, effect theory wants to collapse those... Oh, Andrew Villages. Oh, sorry, I thought I didn't know what you were talking. No, that was a bit. Scary. Oh my God, yeah, yeah. Andrew Village, yeah. Well, you would have probably, if you're an SBL member, you would have probably been asked to fill out his little form, and unless you kind of do delete, 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 delete. I was like, this is an interesting survey. It's published. Um, I can tell you where it's published. It's it's it makes kind of very uh yeah. All right, okay, yeah. I can I can tell you. So he. It was basically um, a Myers-Briggs kind of framework. Yeah, it was a Myers-Briggs one. Um, where is it? I will tell you. Uh, you know, that works really well. You know, that uh, of course, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, where do I talk about that? Um, once, once you find it, transition. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, where is it? Oh, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. Andrew Village, psychological type functions and biblical scholarship and empirical inquiry among members of the Social Society of Biblical Literature. It's in, very interesting, this mental health, religion and culture, 18, 2015. Yeah, read it, it's great. <laughs> I mean, but, but what's more troublesome, if he's a sociologist and found this, I mean, you could, you can, but how people are self describing themselves. Is really interesting. Yeah, and other in others. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, that was the sick. Sorry, I thought it was Katie that had made the sick. Yeah. Okay, shall I sit? Thank you. Uh, it's up to you. Yeah. <laughs>